Good afternoon. Oh, that's loud. Um, my name is Pam Saltenberger, and I'm the president of the Kingsley Art Club. And I really want to welcome all of the Sierra College students who are in the audience. So give yourself applause. This is pretty exciting. Um, you have now made this the most populated lecture we've had so far this year. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I, I want to talk about a few things before we start with this wonderful presentation. But we do something every uh, two years called the Crocker Kingsley. And it's a wonderful juried show. Uh, it's being held at Blue Line Arts up in Roseville. And um, they're prize winners. We've got, uh, I think, 2,400 entrants from all over the United States, possibly the world. I don't know about that. Um, but they'll um, be judged on um, December 3rd. And then there's a big reception at Blue Line Arts on December 17th, starting at 6 o'clock. And everyone that's part of the Kingsley is welcome to go to this reception. So it's really exciting. Some of the works are amazing. And the artists get you know, substantial prize money. And it's pretty fun and exciting. Then Scott Shields, uh, the chief curator of the Crocker, picks five or six pieces that then come and are shown at the Crocker. So it's a big deal, and the Kingsley members work really hard to make this happen. And uh, I encourage you all, again, December 17th, reception, 6 o'clock. Um, I'm hoping that you were able to pick up the, this sheet that has all of the upcoming lectures. Um, I have to thank William Ishmael, who's our program chair, that he's got us all the way out through May, which is amazing. And so we're looking forward to it, and especially because we're live, and um, but we also are being taped. And so you can see it uh, again and again and again, if you want. Um, I want to encourage the students that are here to consider joining the Kingsley Art Club. We, we do actually some really fun things, and we have some student or some artist studio tours. We have some receptions. Things were slowed down during the pandemic. But a student membership is $25 a year. And also encourage you to join the Crocker Art Museum. And there, a student membership is $50 a year. And they're pretty amazing organizations to participate in. And especially since I would imagine many of you are artists, um, be a wonderful way to continue learning and growing in, in your field. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to William Ishmael, our program chair, who's going to introduce our amazing speaker. Thank you. So, so I'm going to introduce Anthony, but I'm going to start by saying, you know, he's the kind of guy that you think, well, he needs no introduction because we, we all know him. But you only know him from the slice that you know him. And he wears many hats, as you'll soon realize. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so he's an art maker. He's a ceramicist. He's an educator. He's a community builder. He lives in Aubrey, lives in the foothills. Uh, people in the foothills know him, I think, better than the people in the valley. But that's, that's going to change. Uh, but he began his career as an arts educator facilitate arts experiences for foster, homeless, and incarcerated youth. And that's kind of speaks to his heart. Uh, some of his community collaborations, and he'll cover some of these in his uh, PowerPoint, a 10,000 square foot art center for the Auburn community. He was one of the facilitators, founders. Uh, he has helped establish a citywide art walk in Auburn. Uh, he was part, he led the Standing Guard T-Bowl project which made 1,800 bowls of tea, tea bowls, for representing each of the Placer County residents that was interned at Tule Lake during the war. Um, and he also participated in the creation of the Art of Real Food, which was a cookbook which um, uh, Joanne Neft put together, taking her recipes from what was available at the farmer's market that week and creating a meal. And all the crockery was Anthony's in the book. 
Uh, he also facilitates a weekly donation-based art workshop in his Auburn studio, which he says, for a diverse community of makers. So for the majority of this, my Saturdays for the last decade, I've been part of this diverse community of makers. So I can, I can testify he's an excellent mentor. When he gives you that side eye and says, what have you got in mind for that piece? You know you need to listen because he's going to have a suggestion. <laughs> of this, this year marks his 25th year of providing technical operation support for the art, design, and gallery programs at Sierra Community College. So Anthony's going to come out shortly, but before we do that, we're doing the world premiere of a video that he prepared especially for the Kingsley and for today's presentation. And when I say the world premiere, that's kind of modest. It's actually the intergalactic premiere of this video. <laughs> and you will understand that more when you see it. So let's roll the video. Thank you. The wisdom traditions say, the best way to reach enlightenment is through yoga, the yoga of meditation. This particular meditation is for you to listen to Maha Vakyas. Maha means big ideas, cosmic ideas. Even though the sutras seem disconnected with each other, they're actually coming together in a web in a matrix of threads, which is what sutra means. We are space. We are the sun. We are the directions above and below. We are the gods. We are the demons. We are all beings. We are darkness. We are the earth, the ocean, the dust. We are the wind, the fire, and all this world. We are omnipresent. The world exists in us. The infinite consciousness. She sees the truth who sees that there is no division at all between the self and the other, and that the one infinite light of consciousness exists as the soul reality. Be firmly rooted in the non-existence of your ego self. It came into being through ignorance and delusion. When we lose this false identity, we will realize our essence as the supreme being or infinite consciousness, and we will be freed from all conditioning and all limitations. The universe is but a long dream. The ego sense, and also the fancy that there are others, are as real as dream objects. The soul reality is the infinite consciousness, which is omnipresent pure, tranquil, omnipotent. 
In the infinite consciousness, we have created each other in our fancy. We create worlds as the natural expression of our own being. After all, what is the truth concerning the things of this world, except how they are experienced in our own consciousness? What is the duration of a lifespan in eternity? This lifespan of ours is but a trivial moment. Eternity stretches before and after it. Existence is the infinite, unbounded consciousness. A lifespan is just a single thought in that consciousness. That which is known as a person is nothing other than the self experiencing the infinite. The self does not go, nor does it come. For space and time derive their meaning from consciousness alone. In everyone's consciousness there is a different idea of the world. Death and other such experiences are like cosmic dissolution, the night of cosmic consciousness. When that comes to an end, we wake up to our own mental creation, which is the manifestation of our ideas, notions, and delusions. In truth, the cosmic mind, the personal mind, and the infinite space are all of one substance, pervaded by the infinite consciousness. Therefore, regardless of what you have created, you can create as many worlds as you like. Millions of universes appear in the infinite consciousness, like specks of dust in a beam of light streaming into the room through a hole in the roof. The inexorable passage of invisible and intangible time eats up all creatures. Knowing this, the wise keep their attention on the timeless. We are at peace when we are established and witness consciousness. This lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down the steep mountain. But now, I am free. I am grounded in being. I am grounded in the infinite consciousness and I can see lifetimes ripple by like waves in the vast ocean of consciousness I am free I am awake I am liberated
Hej. Welcome. How are you? Good. Grateful for you being here. Grateful for the students here at college representing. Awesome. Thank you. Grateful my family's here, my friends are here. Um, grateful to have a conversation. At some point, a presentation will come up, and then we'll start talking. So, an artist's alchemy. What does it take to make an artist? What does it take an artist to make? That's kind of what we're going to cover today. So they found these abalone shells. And some suggest that they're 100,000-year-old paint palettes. They were found in South Africa. If you didn't all know, most of us are from Africa. It's the origin of human evolution, consciousness. And it predates a lot of what we thought humans were, or what we could do, how we evolved. The ochre trade, iron, which we use a lot in ceramics, they now can date back to 100,000 years. They're heading towards almost 300,000 years. So I think we're going to continue to learn more and more about us as humans and how we evolve. We keep learning more every day. I thought this was amazing. They know through fingerprint analysis that the cave paintings were mostly women. The very first artists. Now we don't know why or what they were doing, but we do know that they were mostly women. Hey, museum structure, figure that out. That's what it's about. Me, my mom. This woman, you know, imparted my consciousness. Single parent for many years. Did whatever she could to make sure that her son had the education, the environment, to cultivate his curiosity. And as some teachers wanted to do early on, she cultivated the curiosity. She didn't medicate it. And I'm thankful. So we're in the bus. So in the 1970s, my mom decided that San Jose was not the place she wanted to hang out. And so we moved to Dutch Flat, to some friend's property, into a school bus. Living the van life way before it was fashionable. <laughs> There's the bus. It was pretty magical. Dutch Flat being what, six years old, five years old? Roaming the streets, getting in the red dirt. I wonder what influence that had. Hmm. Um, nothing but great memories from my childhood. Meet my dad. He came special delivery in Colfax at the post office. Hair salons and heating and air. So I grew up in the family business. I learned a lot of skills. I learned about a work ethic. I learned a lot. I didn't always like the learning. I didn't like weekends, cleaning and maintaining and growing the family businesses, but it taught me a lot. It taught me about work. It taught me about Taught me soft skills, how to deal with people, hanging out in the hair salon. Man, you learn a lot. <laughs> you learn a lot. Um, I also got side gigs. I got jobs. I was cleaning people's houses. I was washing windows downtown. I never had to flip burgers. I always had opportunity within the community of folks that I was hanging out with.
I can't say enough for the public education system that helped me along the way. I'm hoping we get some of what we had back because we've lost some of it. Sierra College on the left, Weimar Hills Junior High School on top, and that's the current art faculty <laughs> at Placer High School. Some friends, some former students. The guy on the left there was a member of the Blue Man Group. Uh, the guy with the beard in the middle, Red Johnson, he was Wayne Tebow's TA once upon a time at Davis. And Kaya on the left there under the arts head was one of our very first students, Red and I, Kid Art Summer School programs. She's now the chair of the art department at, at Placer High School. And that's Katie Freeze on the right, lifelong educator and friend. Shop class. So we have kids right now coming to Sierra College, unfortunately, that don't know how to use scissors. I'm not joking. And also, the lines on a ruler are a mystery to some. I gotta tell you that my shop classes really demystified a lot of those processes. Wood shop, ninth grade, 10th grade, Placer High School. This was my first foray into what we call plastic arts, so liquid media. That was aluminum cast in a sand bed. Then you had to use a drill press to drill the holes, and you had to go to Mr. Balaam's wood shop. Mr. Mating had the metal shop, Mr. Balaam had the wood shop. And so then you would make your backer board, you would, after you casted your piece and you used the belt sander and you used the drill press and you used all these tools and you used your hands to make these things. Incredibly empowering, incredibly powerful skill sets that I think we need. Who's gonna fix your stuff? Sometimes you can Google it, sometimes you can't. Once upon a time, I had that choice. Baseball or the beach. I was enrolled in college in San Diego. I wasn't really talking to my parents at this point. You know, I was 17 years old, I thought I knew it all, and I kind of did. No, I mean, not really, I'm sorry. I, I knew what I knew. And I had the choice to either go to Seattle and play in a summer league with the Seattle Mariners, or go to San Diego where I was registered in school, and try that out. The beach one. <laughs> I have no regrets, because then that led me down this path. Lana, Lana Wilson, amazing ceramic artist. What the hell is a non-functional teapot? <laughs> That's pretty much what I thought at the time. And then over the years, I sort of started to understand more. Hi. There's, those who know my work actually can see a lot of Lana in the work. And then we have Sierra College. Back to public school. Back to these women right here. Pam on the left, Rebecca Gregg in the middle, Dottie Brown on the right. And then not represented here, but equally as important, Jim DeVore and Jim Adamson. I don't know why I'm feeding back. They cultivated a, more of my curiosity, more of my interest in the arts and they supported it every step of the way. I can't thank them enough. Jim DeVore left me with this legacy um, of thinking. He's still around, he's a kind of a renaissance guy, he's a pilot, he's an architect, he's a sculptor, he's an amazing teacher, 
And he left me with this idea, vision, voice, and craft, that I sort of apply to all of my work. We all have this idea. We have a thing in our head that we want to make, the vision. We all have a unique voice, a way of speaking. And then we all have an ability, or we're working on an ability with a material. How good are we at it? How well do we push clay around? How well do we paint? How well do we play our instrument? I think those are important frameworks for making art. And so I try to use them. I try to use them in my teaching. I try to use them in my making. Thank you, Kingsley Art Club. Many moons ago, that piece that you just saw, let's see if I can go back. That piece on the left, it's, it's actually glowing orange, but it's a black and white photo, so you can't see. Um, it was about the death of my biological father due to Agent Orange. And we were in yet another war, and we were yet again fighting people somewhere else. And it kind of motivated the making. And then Henry Hopkins, who is a huge person in the art world, unfortunately now deceased, said, hey, bring that work. And it was actually in the Crocker Art Museum, in the old museum, and it was the very first museum show that I was in. And that instilled great confidence in, hey, maybe, I, maybe there's something in this, this art thing. Maybe I should continue. Larry, I hear he's here. There he is. Wow. So, like my parents, with unconditional support, as they provided uh, community service, the legacy that they've provided, they were uh, tremendous community builders. Well, so was Larry. Um, and Larry welcomed me into the Auburn Arts Center um, as a student, as a maker. And he shared. He shared with me about life. He shared with me about how to throw pottery. He opened up this whole, the back area for I was like, grabbing at this chemistry, doing this. There were really no limits. Uh, he just made it possible for me to make and to, to teach. And along the way, fail here and there. But he's a business partner. We would go on, you'll see later, to do some great things in our community. I was his roadie. He had a great jazz band, a blues band. We would go around the community. I courted my wife on the dance floor to Larry's music. Thank you. Yep, the Auburn Art Center, the original Auburn Art Center on the Carnegie Library building is sort of where all this happened. We would do grant-based programs. A lot of it was tobacco funding or tobacco cessation funding that we would get with uh, Tad Katata in the Office of Education. He would write the grant, we would get the funding, we would deploy the program. We, we had uh, hundreds of students come through. It was very meaningful, very purposeful work. A lot of times I would see these kids for one day I had one moment with them, and then they were gone. Where they went, I don't know. If they came back, sometimes that was exciting. I still remember them, I still have pictures. I wonder where they are now. Hopefully we made a difference. I think in some ways we did. And that space right there, that's empty right now, they're currently trying to reimagine what it will be. However, 
That's where it started. That's where I learned how to throw pottery. That's where the studio was. That's where we had classes. What will it be? They're reimagining that, we'll see. So Larry was the executive director of the Arts Center and the Arts Council. We had some people from LA move up. They started to do some things. I was on the board. That's another thing, young artists. I can't um, encourage you enough to start getting involved with your local arts agencies. Start when you're young, start volunteering, get on the board. Start doing the work. Start volunteering. Stuff happens. You will grow as an artist. You will grow as a person. And you will help your community. And the one thing that I see, especially up the hill, is that we have a lot of veteran, you know, middle-aged dudes and older. But, you know, we need you young folks. We need you. We need your ideas. We need your energy. We need your creativity. We just need you. You're going to show up. You're going to save us. I am hoping. So creating community exhibitions, galleries, and partnerships. That's what we did with the arts building, which you'll see in a minute, and the art walk. There really wasn't a gallery scene. We didn't really have gallery spaces. So we had to create them. And we got creative. Um, and businesses were, they were pretty down with it uh, because they understood the value of having art in their establishments. We were putting art in bars. We were putting art at the advertising agency. We were putting art in restaurants. Kind of, I think before it became fashionable, it sort of is happening everywhere now, but it's not always the perfect venue for your work. But if you're starting out, Heck, and if you're trying to grow a gallery base and help a community understand what's possible, then heck, you do what you need to do. And this is what we did. By the way, that work you see in there is my early work. That's where, you know, the, the work changes. I used to do a lot of installation work. I used to do a lot of painting. My, my formal art training or background Beyond Sierra College is painting and printmaking. Clay's just a bad habit I picked up about 30 years ago. <laughs> That's how I say. There you go. What do you do? You go to Main Street. We were, at the time, separating from this group who had kind of taken over the Arts Council and said, That's fine. You want to drive it your way, go for it. And Larry and I said, we're going to go do this. And so we went and did this. And this was create uh, arts, retail, technologies, and services. If you were somebody that needed a photograph of your work, Keith Sutter Photography in the back had a cove. He could do professional photography. If you needed a design package, we had a designer. If you needed a, uh, we had the first cyber cafe. See, that, see all those? There's a label. See all those high-tech computers right there? Look at those. State of the art, man. And look at that Mark Gordon installation right there. People were like, what the f is that? Um, it was a 1950s box. Another failed business downtown. Main Street America. Walmart had been doing this to everybody in the 90s. And we said, not in our town. And so ourselves, and about a half a dozen young folk coming back to the area, opened up bars, restaurants, galleries. And now, I would say, I would say occupancy rates were maybe 50, 60% at that time. Now, if you drive downtown Auburn, you can't find a space. It's a scene. A lot of breweries, you should come check it out. Come visit. Oh, and this, we won an award. 
family business, right? Started a business, won an award, recognized for the contributing to the economic ecology of the downtown region. There was no money, but there was a recognition that, hey, these guys took a 10,000 square foot space, put their open sign up downtown, put their checkbook on the line, and hey, things changed for the better. Things happened. People started renting spaces. More businesses started getting opened. It was a pretty cool thing to be part of. This is what it looks like now, the GGA today. It's called the General Gomez Art Center now. The actual son of the building owner who we rented from saw the value in what we had created, and so did others over the years, and it has continued. The community has an appetite for what we did and what they continue to do, and the space is a fixture in downtown now. I don't see it going away anytime soon. Found my partner, became a dad. Lots of love. You can't do what I do, what we do as artists, as makers, in a vacuum. It takes community, it takes people, it takes someone to support you. Tina, thank you. And that's our son, Andrew. He's bigger now. <laughs> Sierra College. As I heard William say in the beginning, I've been there about 25 years as an employee. I was there a few years as a student. It's been home. This is the, these are one of the, this is the printmaking and paint lab. I see Eric down there, hi. <laughs> Eric's one of our faculty, he does it. That, is that your painting too? I think it is. Yeah, it's the start of Eric Castellano's painting. You should check him out. He can, he can paint. So this is a paint and printmaking lab at Sierra College. It looks much the same as it did when I was a student. Here is the new parking structure built right behind this set of labs, and back there, see what that is? On the other side of that, towards the clouds, is our new $60 million liberal arts building in which the art, design, fashion, photography, ceramics programs will be housed. We're moving in there, we'll be operational next fall. Yeah. It was about a seven-year planning process, of which I've been part of, and I'm happy to say it's moving along quite briskly. And uh, it's going to be unlike, we ha unlike anything that I know of what we have in the region, and we're really excited. So we're excited for our students. They're going to be hanging out in these spaces. Standing Guard was conceived by Rebecca Gregg as a way to honor those Japanese citizens from Placer County who were put in prison for being of Japanese descent. Because in our country, we have a legacy of oppressing people that don't look like us or that we're afraid of. And so we facilitated a project that tried to understand in a physical way what 1,806 people look like. This is a condensed or a compressed version just to get it on the slide, but um, we created a 20 foot by 100 foot cage in the center of campus. We invited people, we, we created 1,806, we created more, but we installed 1,806 T-bowls. Uh, we created an ash glaze. I went to the actual prison camp site at Tule Lake and we took uh, soil samples and we, it was mostly volcanic ash because that's what you have up in Shasta. Um, and we created an ash glaze from the site, and then we glazed the tea bowls with the ash glaze from the site. Then we brought them back to Sierra College and we installed them in the 20 foot by 100 foot cage. 
and we invited no more than 100 people in an hour, and we symbolically had them sign away their citizenship, and we branded them 4C, which is enemy alien, and they hung out, and then as a, they were ready to leave, we gave them back their citizenship, and they selected a bowl, as long as they promised not to let this shit happen again. Right? Seems like we still have some learning in this area. I wish the work was irrelevant, but it's not. It seems to have more relevance in a lot of ways. Those people right there, I actually know. I didn't take the picture, but therein lies my community. I'm connected to these people. Um, the Fujis, they own Tasuda's Market, which was a very historic market in Old Town. That's Robin. Robin is married to Tim. That's Katie. Katie is now uh, maybe 25, graduate school, Oregon. And I play baseball or softball with her dad, who's a local attorney in town, or I used to. And I had no idea that they were going to show up that day, but the community came out. There, I think William talked a little bit about this. Uh, Joanne Neff, a force of nature and a force for good in our community, a uh, huge art patron of the arts, uh, the person, I think, largely responsible 30 years ago for the renaissance of the farmer's market movement that we see now. Uh, she created a, some, a series of cookbooks, and this is but one of them, and invited me to make some work for it. So we did. There's some of the work. That's a wood kiln. Anybody, been, anybody fired the wood kiln? Anybody? Yeah? A few people? Yeah? So this is in Penryn. There's a lot of history that's been made in this kiln, the building of it, the firing of it, uh, the community that's been built around it, the creativity that's been explored within it. Here's some of that history. There's a lot of... Um, that list is a pretty big list of ceramic art history. There's a few of them. That's Rudy, sweetheart of a guy. Again, they're no longer with us, but their legacy li lives on forever. I believe the Crocker has an extraordinary acquisition of uh, some new Rudy pieces. Really gentle human, learned a lot from all of them. This is Rodney. He's the owner of the property in the kiln. He'll Tom Sawyer you into doing anything, almost and uh, responsible for helping to bring Inseca to town uh, a year or two ago. We, he and I and others went up to Oregon. I think that's where it was. He was at the Oregon Convention Center at the time. I took that pic. And we pitched to the board that, hey, you should come to Sacramento. And lo and behold, they did. Oh, that's me. My younger years. Different hat. Building stacks of Pete is for you. Those of you who don't know, um, Pete Volkus is considered, and that's this guy right here, right? Right? He's considered the father of Western ceramics. Some, I should say, consider him the father of Western ceramics. Some consider him a misogynist, and some consider those who've worked with him Volkus's men. We've heard that. I never experienced that myself, but you know, I'm just honoring the perspective that others have. History is an interesting thing, it kind of flows forward and back. Um, Pete was very generous with his time. Prior to 1950s, clay was only thought of as a, something to drink coffee out of or, or something to eat off of. It was a plate. 
or it was a step to bronze. You made the clay thing, then you made the mold, then you made the wax, then you made the bronze. Well, Pete comes along, had won all these awards in functional ceramics, and he comes along, he did his thesis in lids at Arts and Crafts, if you didn't know that. His thesis, lids, two years just making lids. So he won all these awards, and then he had this great, it was a very historic meeting uh, at Archie Bray in Montana, the Brick Factory. And he met Shoji Hamada, Bernard Leach. Rudy was there. He was on the last slide. And Pete tells the story. I've heard it a couple of times. Hey, what do you think about the work to Shoji through translation? And Shoji says, well, it's nice, but I'd really like you to let the clay be the clay. I want to see the clay. I want to see more of the clay in your work. I'm paraphrasing, and that's a remembering of the quote, but essentially that's what he told Pete. And that transformed his way of making. It transformed ceramics because then he started ripping things apart. He started puncturing. He started, you know, his quest for the one mark. Um, and the rest is sort of ceramic art history in that he is, again, by many, considered one of the fathers of Western ceramics. So that's the inside of Rodney's kiln, Big Mama. Um, and these are some pieces of mine that have been through the kiln. Uh, these are part of the swine series of forms that I created for, oh, about a decade. Some of the fowl forms. I'm interested in pigs and birds, or was for a while, um, um, because of their association with humans. You know, the way that disease transfers from humans to birds and pigs to birds and birds to humans. Um, their place as national symbol, their place as a food source. Um, and this specifically was done when my, uh, one of my grandmothers had passed away and I saw, I saw the family sort of consuming her. Uh, and it's titled Willful Blindness. And it's a bone jar. And it was more of a metaphorical bone jar. Her bones aren't in it. But it was important, and it is important as a piece for me in my formation. This piece right here was a piece that was a, a major breakthrough for me. It was an out of the wood kiln. There's no applied glaze to it. It's wood ash. What you see there, those lines dripping down, or slip trails and wood ash. Um, it was in Feats of Clay. It used to be a national, international show that Ray Gonzalez started many years ago. It was in the kilns uh, at Gladden McBean in, in Lincoln, and it was the show to get in at the time. If you got into Feats of Clay, it was a good show. Um, it was good for your career. I got in, Feats of Clay 10. It was awesome, great company. Um, and Ken Ferguson was the juror that year who ran the Kansas City Art Institute. And so to be, you know, you always want to get your work in front of people and see what they say. Well, how do they, how do they look at the work? How do they perceive the work? Um, and it doesn't mean that if you don't get in a show that your work's crap. It just means that, hey, they thought it was worthy. And I've had many more rejections than I've had acceptances for all you students out there. I, Arthur Gonzalez has a great book. He has a book of just rejection letters. <laughs> yeah, you should check it out sometime. And I, I think that's, that's the ultimate, right? Uh, another foul form. This is the inside of the kiln. That's that piece you just saw earlier, but just sitting there in the kiln raw. Thank you. Vintage work. Sometimes the work was more literal, once upon a time. This artichoke here is about two feet around. This is about, I don't know, three feet high from top to bottom. That's my wife's face cast years ago, and that's about, I don't know, five feet tall. I used a lot of cast forms, assemblage. 
Again, no glaze on this. That's wood fired. That's raku fired. That's wood fired. No glaze. No applied glaze. The ash collects and then creates its own glaze. The ash collects on the piece that the kiln is fired for days on end. Four cords of, of oak in three or four days. Ash collects, 2400 degrees, things start to melt. Here's some of the digital clay works. In the movie, what you saw were representations of this. The digital clay um, hybrids, as I call them, are all done from my iPhone, taking still photographs of in process or finished works, then recomposing the works in Instagram layout. And then from Instagram layout, the fractals or pieces are put in a timeline. And then that timeline is animated. And so that's what you saw in the movie piece, which Gabe Gonzalez, I mean, man, what a great movie maker, huh? I mean, I was, thank you, Gabe. I was honored. I think I, think I see Marsha down there. Hi, Marsha. What a great studio they have. Clay Art Studio 814 down on Alhambra. Uh, I was fortunate enough to do this show posthumously with MC Richards, who, you know, seminal figure, the poet, the potter, the philosopher. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Currents. This is what we're doing on the property. I have about you know, half an acre above Old Town and Auburn. We have a half an acre above Old Town and Auburn. Uh, uh, this is a shipping container that I was going to do something with for eight years. And in the last eight weeks, I did something. We made a gallery because we're on the studio tour. And so the Placer Artist Studio Tour I'll plug right now. We'll be around this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Come check it out. We're site number 40. Here's some of the work currently in the container. Some of the last wood fire pieces. So Rodney moved to France, by the way, if you don't know this. Rodney moved to France, hanging out there. So I don't know when we're going to fire those wood kilns again. But again, no glaze, applied glaze. That's just colored slip clay on the outside. That's reduction fired, gas kiln, uh, also gas fired. That's the container. It's sort of a postmodern cave, wouldn't you say? That's kind of what I think it is. Uh, all out of recycled and repurposed materials with a budget of less than $5,500. Try doing that in today's construction market. That's including the price of the container. Time tracking. See some of my favorite pieces. That, this is my favorite piece out of the last wood firing. No applied glaze. I use um, casting, doll casting slip, uh, cone five casting slip. You can buy it at Alpha Ceramics or any of your local supply houses. That's what you see on the outside, and that's just subjected to extreme temperatures in the wood kiln, so the crazing, the cracking. Um, this is just black on go. Um, I'm, I'm searching for the mark, searching for the mark tapping into the consciousness that really exists. And really, as artists, I think we just channel. If we're, if we're really doing our jobs, yeah, we bring ourselves to it, but I think a lot of it already is there. It's a pretty big piece, about this big. Joanne Neff owns that one. She, uh, she has a good eye. I like that one. Crocker. Looky there. This happened. We had a parade from the convention center to the Crocker. That's the images you see. And this was the result of a collaborative project. Iana is down there in the audience, I see. Camp Clay. Uh, Rick Parsons. Sharon Virtue. Myself. Who am I forgetting? Anybody? That was the core of it, yeah. 
did this for Enseca, and we marched it to the Crocker. Anyhow, the Im economic impact of creativity. I, I'm going to leave you with a few things to advocate for. We understand that the arts, they're not a handout, for goodness sakes. The arts are a multiplier. The arts are something we need to resource more. For every dollar, the California Arts Council says, and has said for decades, for every dollar you invest in an arts or cultural event, there's a 10 to $11 direct return on direct economic impact in the community. Why wouldn't you invest in the arts? It's, it's nearing $1 trillion as a, as a national economic impact, the arts, all the arts, creative arts. That's more than agriculture and transportation combined. Think about that. Those aren't subsidized. This hasn't changed. This was in 2010, but everything you read, everything you hear, every person you talk to understands that creativity is at the top of the skill sets that we need, you young students, makers, thinkers, to possess, to cultivate. But yet we don't seem to want to resource it in the same way as other things. Just think about if we put the money that we put into science, into art and design, what kind of innovation would we have, could we have? This is easy. That's a political soundbite. You know, you're going to get elected talking about that stuff. Really. This is visionary. And I would suggest superior. Because this is infinite. It's not a handout. It's an investment. And this is a problem. If this bill is not changed because the UC gatekeepers think what they do is of a higher value than what we do at the community college. It's going to fundamentally transform arts programs throughout the state. It's a law. They're talking about implementation right now. We're talking about it at the college level because it will fundamentally change the demand for what we do because students are being funneled through pathways that become narrower and narrower and narrower so that their financial aid doesn't run out. And that it simplifies the process. Well-intended, but not so well-intended, unintended consequences. Thank you. The shards. There they are. So I invite all of you to take a little piece of this project home. So really what this is about is it is about rippling that sort of creative consciousness back out into our communities. So take a shard, if you're an artist, incorporate the shard. Put it in your clay pieces. Make art with it. If you're so inclined, send me an email. Let me know how you used it. Let the consciousness waves ripple. Ripple on.